we have a great day. Um, I just one please forgive me uh, through the day I asked you to please give me uh, your trash. <laughs> and uh, and the other thing I want to say to you is let's learn a lot and have a good time. As I said yesterday, this is a very, very exciting time for us in the sickle cell community. I am a fourth generation of mother in my family to have a child with sickle cell. My mother was the first generation that had the, uh, understood all about the genetics and what needed to be done. My brother lived at home with us and he was the right age, I was 51. So we were very blessed. He was a wonderful soul. Um, my daughter's uh, diagnosis was a shock to us. And from that we learned that cheap science is bad science. And my mother really, really believed in the science. And science is coming along, I come along with it. It's going to go very fast. We need all of your support to keep our community healthy and alive until that year gets to And so I ask you to take away with you with this charge that when you get any opportunity to in any way educate people about this disease. And even if you're just saying if, if the disease has been explained simply as uh, something the red cells clump, you know clumping together and stopping the blood flow and it's painful. That's a simple way of saying of, of explaining something that is so complicated. So it's far more than this. So it's a disease that has a progression, progressive assault on our bodies. So help us, help us, and thank you, you know, continue to fight. I can't say it's not online because that's that safe. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that safe. I got my hands. It's fight on. It's fight on, yeah. Okay, so, so today, um, all right, our first talk is going to be on the complication of sickle cell disease, and our moderator, you know, the you know, I feel now. Is your microphone now, on? Now, I'm going to give information to <laughs> Right. Yes. I kill names and careers, and I think everything sounds like chicken. Okay. Oh, you're good. Okay. Good? good morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay. This one's not on? Oh, use the handheld. Use the handheld. Okay. Is this better? Oh, turn it on first. Good morning. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good. <laughs> Um, so I am Theopia Jackson. I first want to say thank you so very much to Dr. Carol Mother for inviting me. It's such an honor and a treat to always come down and be part of this conversation and community. It's really nice to kind of see familiar faces. Um, I've been invited to serve as moderator, just sort of open up with a few comments and kind of set the tone for this series of panelists who I am very privileged to be among. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Um, for me, I just want to remind us about the human faces, and we really are talking about um, developing persons as we're looking at the science of sickle cell, the psychosocial issues of it, all those different components. But we're really talking about a whole person in their full context and the ways in which they are developing through their own lifespan. And we all know that any chronic illness, but definitely sickle cell, can move through in a very unpredictable way. So as you take in the information today, please do not limit yourself to a snapshot of time in someone's life, but instead challenge yourself to understand what are the implications across the person's lifespan. Think about it for yourself. If you're someone who does not live with sickle cell disease, what would you, what would your life accomplishments and experiences be like had you also had to contend with such an unpredictable illness? Okay, so we're going to hear more specifically about the science and the, and the issues and what happens to the body and the brain as it is being impacted by sickle cell disease. I sort of, as someone who does not live with it, but live with those who do, and I really want to honor the courage in which I've been able to witness them live their lives and watching the ways in which their bodies can begin to fail them 
despite their aspirations and motivations and desires and their intentionality. This is not true across the board, of course, but we do want to underscore that these are some real viable um, challenges. I can go through this litany of issues in terms of you know, prior prism, what does that mean for a 5, 6, 7, 10, 20, 30 year old male to have to have someone um, physically help his erection because it's so painful. So I think about just think about the idea of priapism, what does it mean for one's identity formation and, and procreation and sense of self and, and the mother-child relationship and father-child relationship when you're having to pay attention to how this pain episode is now impacting genitalia. Just to kind of underscore a few. Also looking at the idea of having a newborn baby, having the hand foot issues where they're, 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 your infant child, is their hands are swelling so much and their feet is very painful and you can't relieve that and you have to go to have medical intervention. Just wanted to really underscore the lived experiences of these diagnostic medical terms. Okay, so this can be very stressful. So pain is very stressful, and pain is also very complex and subjective. And we're going to hear more about that again as we hear from our panelists. But here, what I'm wanting to sort of put in context is the, the biopsychosocial model of trying to understand the lived experiences for people that when they're dealing with pain and these other vulnerabilities associated with sickle cell disease, it can impact them in several different ways. And, and this figure is not the best one because we're talking about the interplay, not so much the overlap of each of these items. So and we also want to pay attention to that pain is more, there's more than sickle cell pain going on. And what I like to say for the patients I've, I've been able to work with, all pain is real, but all pain is not turned on by sickle cell. But sickle cell pain is turned on by all pain. So what are some of these other pains we're talking about? As I said, looking at the biopsychosocial model here, we want to, I like this a little bit better because you're at least you're beginning to, to see more of that overlap. The, the, the basic inherent human stressors that people go through are exacerbated when someone has is at the risk of having a sickle cell pain episode. And then we want to think about this particular population that it raises the probability of having not only mental health challenges, but I'm going to also say spiritual challenges, trying to really understand who they are in the world. And some of the ones that are most vulnerable are issues around depression and sadness. And I wanted to underscore here that many times when children are presenting with what looks like anger and outbursts, the people forget that uses a good sign of depression. But we're just wanting to treat the angry behavior. But there's something that feeds that. A lot of times it's anxiety and worries. I also think that we're still, still raising awareness around the association of PICA for our population. And many good intended providers across the board are missing that. Or if we do see PICA symptoms are trying to address it from a mental health, psychosocial perspective and not really understand there could be a biological implication for that. Again, I'll defer to my colleagues as they go through this more in greater detail. ADHD, love to underscore this myth because there can be many symptoms that can look like ADHD, but there's different etiologies for ADHD. So therefore, the treatment must be different. For some of our youth and, and adults who present with symptomatology, it could be a function of how they've been socialized, hypervigilance within the, within the communities, or it also could be an ongoing compilation of having those nocturnal um, infarcts. And again, our colleagues will speak more to that. Look at the cumulative impact of these neurological um, assaults on that developing person can eventually look like symptoms of ADHD. So therefore, it needs more than medication as an intervention, if you will. And then, of course, there's this issue of trauma that we've been hearing a lot more in the community. But before I move to the next slide, what I want to underscore here is for me, I also want to say that our good medical interventions are wonderful for saving the body, but they're also part of a trauma experience. Because the realities are children developing bodies are not supposed to have to go through acute chest syndrome. They're not supposed to have to go through a BMT, all these other issues. So we have wonderful technology, but they also come with a psycho psychological and emotional and spiritual impact of potential trauma. 
So that which we do to save their bodies can also hurt their spirits if we're not paying attention to these cumulative effects. And then, of course, I hope this group is becoming more and more aware of looking at the ACEs. Is, is this something that's familiar for everyone here? Okay, so just very basically, this was a phenomenal study that was done through the Kaiser Permanente um, system where they were working with, I want to say maybe 17 to 20,000 folks. There's a series of questions that they're asking people, adults, about their childhood experiences and, and the issues of being exposed to divorce or um, loss of a loved one. And the idea being here is that the more the adverse, the more adverse childhood experiences that someone is dealing with, the greater the probability of them having some neurological developmental challenge, the greater the probability of social emotional problems, not being able to cope, and then adapting some high risk or unhealthy coping strategies that of course and ultimately all lead to early death. And so what they're finding in this general population was very high. But then, and I would say here is where our psychosocial teams <laughs> We have a lot more work to do <laughs> to try to even this off. Right. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. However, before I move from here, I want to say too, and this is, I believe, why Carolyn brings me because I get a little social justice advocacy going here. So this is our general population. This is the average Joe, which in America means average middle class white heterosexual population, okay? So if we're finding this in the average, I'd like to ask how does it get further impacted when you start thinking about issues of institutional oppression, racism, poverty, and other complexities that are driven primarily by a membership in a particular group that may be very different, not may, is very different from our general group here. Okay. So this begins to talk into what we mean by implicit bias. And what we're saying here is that sometimes without realizing it, providers, consumers, we have our own internal script about who folks are. And sometimes it's not known to us, but it's always operating. That can have two different patients presenting the exact same issues, but I'm treating them differently. However, in my mind, I'm consciously saying to myself, no, I'm treating them both the same. I'm an equal opportunity provider. I'm doing good. But, there, but, but there's something about how one does something, and I may either be a little bit more critical, a little more harsh, or maybe even a little bit more forgiving and not holding them accountable, or not realizing it, that I'm missing something. So here we're talking about implicit bias, and we start thinking about issues of race and racism. And this, and this, this work was initially done out of Harvard University. If we had time, I would have invited everyone to do the implicit um, bias test. It's a wonderful one. It's, it's easily accessible online. But what it's speaking to is that the finding is that you can see the same children, same gender, same age, but somehow our African American children are perceived to be older and not seen as children. Okay, and the way we're, and we can see this, and the reason I'm bringing this up is real time, of course. We all know that the issues of community violence and police brutality is nothing new in the African American, black, and brown communities. However, there's been a heightened level of awareness because of the birth of our video cameras. But the piece I'm bringing in here is that what it's really bringing up is that is that reality? Is that two people doing the same thing and responding differently? So if this is happening in our general black population, and in America we have this false idea that sickle cell disease is primarily with African persons because we all know it's a more global disease than that, then it raises it an, another level of vulnerability for services. In addition to just simply being black, now they also have sickle cell, which is perceived as black. Okay, so and there's a lot of work going on in the in, in the in, in the in, in the different disciplines, particularly in healthcare, to try to help raise our own consciousness and awareness around our own implicit biases, unconscious biases, so that we as providers, the, the better we know these, the better we can do better with our clients and the patients that we serve. So, in closing, what I wanted to do, oh good, I kept my little ten minutes here. I want to show a little clip that I found, and I'm going to 
ask my gentleman friend to help me in the back here. <laughs> um, this, this, does anyone know this particular young lady, Crystal Smith? Because she's here in LA and she lives with sickle cell disease. Okay, so you've probably seen this little clip that she's about to do. Was it shown yesterday or anything? Am I repeating myself? Okay, good. So as you see, I could not do this any better. So I thought I would end with her. And just as I said, as I begin to introduce our panelists, oh, it's, I can't switch back to PowerPoint, guys. I'm not that good. <laughs> Please do keep this in the back of your mind. We're really talking about people across their lifespan. So our first distinguished panelist is um, one of my heroes who has been instrumental in training me on understanding the issues and the complexities of sickle cell disease. And this is Dr. Ward Hager, who is the director of the Adult Sickle Cell Program for UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland. And in addition to, and of course his bio is there for you, but I just want to underscore that Dr. Hager was awarded the T32 National Institute of Health Clinical Research Training Award for iron overload in sickle cell anemia. And I do see him as one of our warriors in this work because he's been hanging in there for a long time and contributing to many people's lives. And I want to say thank you before you even begin. We have a lot of accoutrements today. One, two, three. 
You can make me follow up with that spoken word. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I turned it off, I'm sorry. Uh, there you go. Hello? Hello? Okay, I do just have to have a voice. Hello? <laughs> okay, after following that, I just want to take one minute and just follow up on what conferences like this do. Um, why I'm so always happy to be invited. I think uh, Dr. Jackson meant to say that she taught me how to look at kids with a sickle cell. But I remember just the change that we've seen when I first started these many years ago. I don't think there were records for survivors. But they, most of the kids were told they're not going to be funny. Most of them were washed in narcotics. Most of them were truly treated like terminal cancer patients. So when they came in, just give them what they want. That's how I was trained. So as we got better with the science, it has to go hand in hand with everything else because now the kids are living, living longer. They didn't go to school. They didn't really engage. And now they're just really adults. They go wrestling. And it's kind of that different than we're trying to go back and treat our kids better because we're expecting them to live longer. I remember years ago, um, just the, the contrast, I'm happy to end today this morning, where there was a movie, I don't know if anyone ever saw it, to, uh, to all my friends of short. Yes. You know this movie? It's actually, so I forced it, to, uh, huh? So name again? To all my friends of short. Okay. It was um, Bill Cosby starring in it, but it was this pointed movie about a single dad who finds out his son back in his sickle cell. And just realize he's not going to have a son for long. Just the whole idea of it. And now, on the way here, I picked up uh, Chris Reese. Anybody know Chris Reese? Yes. The graduate of Howard. Um, here in LA, 15 years now doing commercials. You know, he's still planning ahead. And this is the shift that we're seeing. We've pushed up, and we, I take everyone in here because it's not just one thing. We need to really focus on these things because we are expecting people to live. This is so awesome. Just so Nothing I said. <laughs> Can you hear me anyway? I'm kind of pretty loud. I'll say how many of these that go through. Okay. So they asked me to come back and um, luckily last time they were here, they asked me to talk about childhood complications, which could take weeks, but I had to like, jam it into I think you gave me 40 minutes. Like, now I get 30 minutes for acute chest syndrome. And I think it's important, um, as I'll go over at the end, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of stuff, mainly focusing on what's different in 2015, 2016 that we've learned about this, but also just a few take-home messages. There are two take-home slides, one is a little more complicated, but there are some more than nothing both, and the second of the two is the most important. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so, all right, so what we're going to do today is basically up there, and I'm not going to be reading slides for you because you read it quickly as I can talk. Um, but we're going to look through this step at a time. And how many people are somewhat familiar with acute chest syndrome? <laughs> and if you have questions, I mean, please ask if you go through because I just want you to know. I'm backing up, I want to kind of review general crises. This is some work that Samir Velas at um, Jefferson did that's so important because we use it all the time. People who have sickle cell know this. Are you going to button on this? I guess it's worth it. So here. Um, that even though you have your crisis, most people have a little program. They kind of know something's going on, they don't feel quite right. Everyone's a little different. It's fascinating. You don't want to be interesting to a doctor, but what's fascinating about sickle cells, everyone's different. You have to kind of learn the individual patient's troubles that they have, and then you can help them better. But you can't go, oh, it's this. I get called all the time from doctors giving me the sickle cell protocol, but labs that I check. That's the way most doctors are trained, and unfortunately, this is so complicated, it doesn't really do that. But you have to look. So there's a little program, and the only reason I'm showing this is it pops up with the crisis when you actually have pain. And notice the average time for an adult is seven days. A lot of hospitals and insurances with um, pay for like three to five days, and they send them home. The average price is an adult is seven days. So some would be a little more or a little less. For kids, it's about five days, but still a little bit longer than they usually if you will budget, I can say it that way. But I just want to point out this word platelets right here, and you'll see why later. So early on, you can see changes in platelets. But Samir um, Balas did, he looked at all these variables for everyone. And interestingly, he can actually come up with patterns predicting crises, but they're different again for everyone. So it takes a lot of work. So it's better just to get to know your patients and usually just ask the person they know themselves best and about what's going on. A quick review of what's happening in here, and you'll, you'll start to pick up a theme here. 
What we also learned in the last few years, they, everyone was told that play, uh, crises are when cells sickle and plug out stuff. Well, you're simply, every cell, that if someone with sickle cell is sickling every couple of minutes anyway. So why does it suddenly cause trouble and gang on and why does it not? And it does seem to be that something's going on, not in the materials, you go from arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, back to veins, back to the heart. Something's happening right beyond the capillary where everything starts to happen. And there are two main, if you will, groups of symptoms. Some are related to low um, um, hemoglobin, and to some of these, and others are related to just thickening of the blood as things get um, plugged in. And that's actually here too with acute chest. You'll see it right there. But also notice again that word. I'm wondering why he's pointing out that word. We'll see in a minute. Yeah. So platelets keep showing up. Something starts to happen here. And what we've learned over the last few years is that crises actually seem to start mainly triggered by white cells and platelets. Not so much the red cells, but as soon as they start doing what they do, the red cells glom on, and then that's where the plug starts. Because the cells that are cycling, cycling every second they go through. Now, before we get to the lung, um, one of the things to think about if my cells going through my body, it goes down to the capillaries, so there's less oxygen, so it tickles. So how does it unsickle? It has to get back to the lung for this oxygen, and really, if there's any oxygen around within a millisecond, it can unsickle. If there is no oxygen around, it stays sickle, and then it gets into the arterial circulation, where it's just not a happy place to be. Our arteries do not like, and you have to realize, when we say arteries and veins, you kind of think of tubes and plumbing. These are really looking deep tissues, and they are not happy um, when certain things happen to them. So the general uh, physiology of sickle, uh, acute chest is um, a couple of things can happen. The cells can go into the lungs, and they're not unsickling, and they start to cause more trouble, they start to cause fluid. Also, what happens when you have severe pain, your bone marrow can actually break loose and get to the lung, and that's actually very common too. And there are other things that can happen, so it's all everything ganging up on the lung. And it's interesting that it happens um, a lot, but not predictably. Most people they, um, have had, will have a, an episode of acute chest in their sickle cell life, but some people get it all the time. Uh, the other interesting things to remember is that acute chest and this ACS has had always been called the leading cause of death. In, the, in, in our institution, not that we're doing perfectly, we've never seen it in about a decade now. Because the one thing that we do really quickly, we're going to talk about. But we see some crisis of people that we thought might have died. So it's not like we have a magic pole that we just were really aggressive when we treat it. So even though it has been, one of the take home lessons is if you were a sickle cell or you know someone does and you're helping them in the hospital, things to make sure that they do. So we'll point those out. Okay, um, it's definitely the second most called the mission. And one of the reasons is if you have any sort of lung symptoms, get to the hospital, get checked. Because it's been built so quickly that um, you won't have time later. And the other thing, again, to stress, and it's also going to be another key, one of the things hydroxyurea does for people with SS-type sickle cell is dramatically knock down episodes of acute chest. It's, one of the, it's actually it's the most powerful effect. All right, so definition. Anybody got a definition? I'd like one. People argue about it because we're not quite sure sometimes when you see an infiltrate what actually is acute chest or when you actually see temperature or what leads to it. Actually, functionally, it doesn't matter because even if you started, say, with an ammonia and that was developing, guess what happens when the blood runs through there? It's not going to unsickle, so it's going to develop acute chest. So if you get someone and you have bone, bone marrow infarct and, and it breaks loose and goes to the lung and it's sitting there, guess what's going to happen there? It's going to develop. And so everything runs together. So the best way to think about acute chest of anyone with sickle cell is if you have any inflammatory symptoms, especially you know, um, with fever and any sort of um, extra change. And that's actually the research definition for acute chest also. So there you go, there it is right there. How's one? Um, any to infiltrate with a fever, and or even some respiratory troubles. So any, or we always tell our patients if you have any trouble breathing, we need to either see you or check it. If you have a fever, just come in. Because that's what we want to get ahead of really quickly. All right, so acute chest syndrome um, happens very quickly. And the darn thing about it is most people that develop it don't have it when they, it's not showing you, obviously. I'm sure the process is going on, but you're not showing it on admission. When you walk in, you may have a fever, you may have some chest pain. Interestingly, the most potent predicting predictor of when you have a huge chest is you're having the worst arm or leg pain you've ever had. And that's actually a big sign that you really have to be careful with the patient. 
often within 24 hours. I mean, it's kind of, these are kind of fuzzy grams, but that's kind of a fairly normal heart. There's a little bit going on. But then they go from here to just about to get intubated. And it can happen really quickly. So if you think about what I said, things are blocking out the cells aren't unsick them, so they're irritating the vessels next to them, it just starts to grow. And it just blossoms, if you will. And then, unfortunately, they're most people are dehydrated, people try to give them fluid, if you need some fluid, but they want them over fluid, and then they start flooding, and everything just goes downhill. Um, so, um, one of the other things to note about um, acute shock is more common in kids. Ages four to six, almost all of the, most of the um, cases happen. This was a study um, done looking at new cases. These are actually all the people over four, um, under four. Um, the percentage, the point is, more happens over four than under four over time. And this is from when we've had one event. They have this like this window um, between six and 10 months that if you've got acute chest, you're likely to get another one. Whether you're, whether you're four or under, you're very likely to get another one. So if you're over that, but that's the time when people have to try to get them in and try to start treating. Usually they have SS, what do we put on? Hydroxyurea. I think we're going to keep saying that word. Because that's the one thing we know really helps. If they're smoking, we try to get them to stop, and otherwise, general lung care, out, and we try to make sure it's better control. All right, so we talked about some of the precipitants. You can see, probably guess the usual suspects. So you have any sort of infection, can set anything up, anything that can irritate the lungs. Bone marrow emboli, which we'll take a look at. Again, you can even clot. Everyone with sickle cell is slightly likely to clot. It's not so much that everyone needs to be on <clears throat> blood lines all the time, but anything else that now tips it a little bit further, you can just form a clot right in the lung. And then obviously, this is another important one for you. Whether it's a fancy word for me, I'm not breathing so deep that my little tiny air sacs in the lungs are clearing. And guess when you get that? You come in, you're in severe pain, you do your narcotics, you're laying in bed, Back, we call it the aspiration position. You're sitting there and getting drowsy, you're trying to summer really from this horrific pain. And you know, sometimes all the best of intentions, the doctors keep getting more and more and more, and then suddenly you're not breathing as much, and guess what you just set yourself up for. So one of the things we're going to talk about is how to kind of kind of watch that. Um, okay, this is just a long list that Dr. Virginsky at our institution did. This is probably the best study of acute chest that was ever done. He brought up everybody from the at multi-sites and looked at what was causing the trouble. Notice this is the fat embolism, it's actually the bone marrow emboli. That was like 9% of the patients. Um, and then you have this list of um, other things, but the important thing is you have some really unusual infections, mix and things that they were able to find out. So the antibiotics you need if you are, have sickle cell and something coming in the lung are usually broader than they would usually give to just the average person coming in. This is a PET scan that was done last year with people with acute chest, and don't worry about so much of the hazogram. The only thing I wanted to point out is this part here, I guess on both sides, it's a stereo, is this is where the white cells are really active. And it just shows you how these the, really lower lobes, the white cells are really firing up. And if we look at x-rays, we'll often see hazes down here first. <clears throat> we are, even on patients that don't have a bird pneumonia, it's just very active white cells. And again, we talk about the inflammation of sickle cell, the, the lining and lining is not being happy with sickle cells in there. This is what's happening. And when white cells aren't happy, what do they do? They release all these chemicals that do no damage. And that's actually a lot of the drive the acute chest syndrome and its own complications. All right, this is um, something that we almost never see anymore um, because one of the unintended consequences of the CLIO law, which means we can't have our own labs, so we have to have everything approved and goes through. We used to have people spit in the cup because then you can stand it, you can actually see the fat in the lab because it'll turn red. And that's what they did over here, let's say, on red sedan on stain. And then the sputum actually is golden. If someone has a huge chest and you want to get them in a cup, and you get enough of it, you actually see like it's, it's, it's a golden color. Interestingly, it's not really, you think it would be, but it's not. It's actually related to just the tissue, the, the, the blood vessels leaking tissue into the, into the lungs, something called an exudate. Um, but that's where you occasionally you'll see that. Um, fat embolism we talked about, remember this is bone marrow. The worst pain you have in your um, arms or legs in a long time or perhaps ever. What's happening is bone marrow is actually sickling. And when it sickles, it dies, and when it breaks loose, it just starts moving too. And the thing, and we, if you think about what goes on, where it's loose bone marrow, the vessels get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it keeps on moving. It's kind of like a, something going on your clot pipe until it gets to the lungs where the vessels get smaller and smaller again. So it just plugs there. And um, that's what happens. And this is actually some bone marrow emboli. Um, this is 
And this is actually a bone marrow, actually, bite right here. But here's an implant. It's actually got bone marrow tissue. It's got some spicules in it from the bone marrow. And these were from the lungs of someone with acute chest. And over here is like the dead bone marrow. This is kind of um, just is acellular, as they say. There should be more stuff in there. It's just kind of this homogeneous field. You really don't see much in the way of what normal uh, marrow parts are. Um, so the other thing we realize now too that we're starting to work more with. How many? What was that word thing you remember again? Platelets, platelets, platelets. We know that seems to have a lot to do now with starting crisis. But what they're starting to look at too is an acute chest. They're actually seeing platelet plugs, which are what these are. Now these, unfortunately, are, um, you know we don't really want to see too many studies like this because these are autopsy studies. But when they actually take a look, what you can see is these are just fields of platelets that are stuck together um, that are causing the, 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 the trouble. And so it does seem like anything that activates platelets. And one of the key things about that, remember the very first slide about the crisis and why I showed it to you with platelets? People that tend to really have severe acute chest will come in with high platelets and they crash. And this seems to be the trigger of what's going on. And actually, they're rising up as a sign of inflammation, and they really start dropping. And you really got to start worrying that they're starting to um, have platelet, and, um, platelet thrown by in their lungs. All right, so what the heck are we going to do about this? Well, half the patients are admitted for another diagnosis, which is usually pain. And again, we talked about arms and legs. I keep stressing that because you'll hear every now and then you hear it. I've seen it so many times. And again, it takes two or three days for the actual x ray changes to come up, even though the process must be going on before then. So if someone comes in with severe pain, you have to assume it could this be acute chest? We always check oxygenation. We're always looking at their lungs. They're always watching to see if anything is going on because it's going to develop fast if it develops. Um, but it can be taken a couple of days. We talked about this, um, severe um, extremity pain, and we watch and watch and watch. We do oxygenation, we do daily blood counts, because if they drop a gram a day, something is really starting to fire up and we make sure they get transfused. Now, um, this is a, uh, this actually was a, a case in the New England Journal of Medicine, which actually walks you through a lot of this too. For, I think you're going to get these slides out um, for people who actually have the references. But this is actually severe acute chest. Everything is happening here. All, um, all five lobes are involved. And it's, uh, that's where you don't want to get. But what do you do? Well, the first thing you want to do, people come 